Attention home buyers, the real estate landscape is changing in August 2024 that could have a major impact on how you buy your next home. From the groundbreaking legal settlement to the new buyer broker agreement, there's a lot you need to know to stay ahead when buying your next home. In this video, I'm going to go over the future in terms of home buying and the changes that are happening in 2024 in terms of the cost and the buyer broker agreement and everything you need to know as a buyer that could have a major impact on your next home purchase. Hello, my name is Tyler Ford, Tucson, Arizona with eXp Realty and welcome to another episode of Living in Tucson, your Tucson Real Estate Connection. In August 2024 is here and there's major changes in residential real estate based on the NAR lawsuit which goes into effect August 2024 across the country, all MLSs. So I'm going to specifically focus in on the buy side and the impact that it has on buyers. And in my opinion, the changes that go into effect have the biggest impact on buyers in terms of cost, potentially having to pay commissions. And so we're gonna dive into the buyer broker agreement, which is now a mandatory form that all buyers have to sign for an agent to show them a home. So I'm gonna break it all down, try to make sense out of it, to keep buyers ahead of the game so you know what you're getting into when buying a home. Before I cover the big changes and impact that this settlement's gonna have on buyers, I first wanna give you a little explanation of the class action lawsuit to kind of get you up to speed if you haven't been following it. So there was a class action lawsuit that some buyers brought against sellers in regards to what we call the co-op compensation. And in the past, I've been a licensed agent for 34 years, it's always been this way. So the co-op compensation was always listed in the MLS. In order to list a property, you had to provide a co-op compensation that the buyer's broker and the buyer's agent would be paid. You could not list a property in MLSs with zero co-op compensation. And that's what the lawsuit was all about. So as a result of the class action lawsuit, co-op compensation is no longer listed in the MLS, so it's not transparent. And they said they did it to keep it transparent, but in my, I would totally disagree. It's now not transparent. It's not that the seller's not gonna pay a co-op, but you don't know what it is. And so they might be paying a co-op or they might not. So part of the negotiation now is negotiating commissions, which in my opinion is a disservice to buyers out there because now you're, you are not, in my opinion, acting on their best interest because you're having to negotiate commissions along with trying to negotiate a deal. So that's that's the first big change. No longer is co-op compensation listed, so it's not transparent. The other huge, huge change is for agents now to show homes to buyers, they have to have what is called a buyer broker agreement signed. And the buyer broker agreement always existed, but it wasn't mandatory. So now in order for a buyer's agent to show a home to a buyer, this buyer broker agreement has to be signed. Otherwise, there's huge fines to the buyer's agent if somebody were to turn them in and they don't have a buyer broker agreement signed. But I'm going to dive into the buyer broker agreement. But in the buyer broker agreement, it covers now commissions that the buyer would agree to if the seller's not willing to pay co-op compensation, some or all. So as a buyer out there, when signing a buyer broker agreement, if you don't have the money for the commissions, the home that you're looking at, if they're not willing to pay a co-op compensation is a home that you might not now be able to buy as a result of you not having enough money to pay the buyer agent commission. So I'm going to go into detail in terms of the buyer broker agreement, but as a buyer out there, don't be surprised. You're now going to have to sign this agreement in order for an agent to show you a home. And if an agent does and lets you in a home without one, 
they can be fine. So I'm going to dive into detail in terms of the buyer broker agreement and the impact that it has on buyers out there. Now let's dive into the buyer broker agreement. And there's two types of buyer broker agreements. But before we dive into the difference, I just want to first give you the definition of what the buyer broker agreement is. And uh, the buyer broker agreement, this agreement is designated to allow a buyer to engage a qualified licensed professional for the purpose of viewing property and receiving contract negotiation and advocacy services through the entire real estate offer and purchase process for these types of properties described below. So there's two types of buyer broker agreements. There's one that you sign that's for all properties and then there's a single property buyer broker agreement. And the reason for that is, is the question is, did you get married on your first date? The answer is no. <laughs> so the buyer broker agreement in the past, you would kind of date, figure out, you know, if the, if the buyer's agent was the right fit for you as a buyer. And then it wasn't mandatory. And I would say half of the agents out there would require a buyer broker agreement and the other half didn't. So it wasn't mandatory. Agents could show homes without it. So now it's mandatory. But the one thing as a buyer that you want to be a little bit careful of is if you don't know the agent well and and, and you're, you just reached out to them and you're trying to figure out what agent you want to work with, you might want to go with a single property buyer broker agreement. Maybe look at your first home just to see if the agent's the right fit for you. But again, once you sign this agreement, if you sign it, for the buyer broker representation for all properties that commits you in a sense and i'll explain what i mean in a sense to that agent uh, so in the agreement it goes over quite a few things but the big big thing and change on it is commission and so as the buyer's agent and the buyer in here it specifies the commission that the buyer's gonna owe if the seller potentially won't cover all or some. So you could, if you agree to it as the buyer, uh, typically you're going to want to negotiate and get the seller to pay your commission. But if they won't pay it in here, it talks about whether or not you're going to be willing to pay the difference, some or all. And there's a lot of buyers out there that just now have barely enough money to pay the down payment and the closing costs. So if you're a buyer out there that's limited on funds and you don't want to pay the buyer's agent a commission, there's properties now that might not be for you because the seller's not willing to pay a co-op compensation. In my opinion, only good when you're under contract in terms of the commission because on line nine, it says cancellation. So either party may cancel this agreement effective upon delivery of written notice to either party unless buyer is under contract to purchase a property. So if you sign a buyer broker agreement and you decide that the agent's not the right fit for you or you kind of want to go on your own, you can do a written notice to the buyer's agent and cancel this at any time. And the buyer's agent could do the same to any buyer out there if they decide that the buyer's not worth working with and I mean, there's a lot of different reasons. I won't go into the details, but on the other side of this, an agent could easily fire a buyer out there and say, I want to cancel where the previous buyer broker agreement had to be a mutual type of agreement in order to do that. Uh, so again, there's two types of buyer broker agreements, one for all properties and a single property buyer broker agreement. But now I'm going to dive into the one, one benefit in my opinion, as a result of all this, because buyers can cancel the buyer broker at any time, you're going to see a lot of agents and the good agents that value their time, they know their worth, they're going to start charging a non-refundable retainer fee because I, you know, there's nothing worse than working with a buyer, spending a ton of time, gas, I mean, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and agents for years and years and years, buyers agents have done tons and tons of pro bono work. And I don't know any other industry out there 
where agents do so much work and they never, ever get paid for it. You know, attorneys, doctors, you know, lawyers. I mean, they all lawyers. I mean, it's all billable hours. And so on the real estate side, I think the one, one positive, in my opinion, I mean, I've scratched my head so many times to figure out the positive to all these changes. And I think it has a negative impact for all parties involved. But the one positive, in my opinion, is buyers, agents, the good ones are going to start to charge a non-refundable retainer fee. And the reason it's non-refundable, it would be credited back. So if you if a buyer's agent charges a non-refundable retainer fee, that would be credited back at the close of escrow based on the commission. So the, the buyer would get it back, but it's non-refundable because for the most part, brokers don't have an escrow account. And so it's non-refundable, which then covers the buyer's agent for their time, their gas and everything that they've done. So I've, you know, I've been talking to a lot of agents and I know there's a lot of agents out there because of the cancellation clause in here. The previous buyer broker agreement, if a buyer went someplace else and bought a home, they were still obligated to pay the commission if they signed the buyer broker agreement. But the way it sits right now, a buyer could easily get out of this by a written notice. So keep in mind as a buyer out there, you might have to pay a retainer fee to an agent in order to get them started in working for you and covering their expenses should you cancel or decide to do something else. That's the big, big change in regards to the buyer broker agreement. Again, it's mandatory and there's a fine for agents that don't get it signed before opening a door and showing people homes. Well, there's one more thing to talk about when it comes to buyers and the changes that are out there. So there's one other form, it's called the unrepresented buyer. And I've been getting this question a lot. I've done a couple videos about what's going on and I've been getting the question, well, what if a buyer wants to go straight to the seller and buy the home if they don't have the money to pay the commission? And that's a great, great question. And I think buyers are a little misinformed because they think if they go straight to the seller, they're gonna get a better deal. And that's not always the case. And it could be expensive for a buyer that's unrepresented and they could make a lot of mistakes if they don't know what they're doing. And there's a certain type of buyer out there, you know, investors that own multiple properties or somebody that bought and sold a lot of homes that are that's pretty confident and they know the process. They know how to negotiate a deal and do all the inspections and protect themselves. So there is a small percentage where they're capable of doing that. But again, thinking you're going to get a deal by going straight to the seller is not always the case. And so if you go straight to the listing agent, a couple different things can happen. You could, they could require that you sign an unrepresented buyer. And in the listing agreement, it specifically has that in there where the listing agent might be getting a little bit more if they're dealing with an unrepresented buyer because it takes more work as the listing agent because you still have to do all the paperwork as a listing agent. You still have to help them schedule inspections. And so as a listing agent, if you're dealing with an unrepresented buyer, it actually takes more time, more liability because they don't have E&O insurance. And so as a result, as a buyer out there thinking that you're going to go straight to the seller and get a better deal, that is not the case. The other thing they could do is do what is called dual agency, where the listing agent could represent both buyer and seller. But there's a lot of states that don't allow dual agency, and that's where the broker represents both buyer and the seller. So that's something that could potentially happen, but it depends on the state that you're in. But an unrepresented buyer basically just says that you're unrepresented, you're representing yourself, and you don't have any representation. So it's definitely an option where you could go straight to the seller as a buyer out there and represent yourself. But there's risk. And not only, you know, if you think you're going to save your, some money and you do on the commission, the flip side of that is if you miss something big, it could be a huge budget buster down the road that could cost you far more than what the commission would have cost you if you had an agent representing you. So again, there's really, as a buyer out there, 
there's really three things. You've got your buyer broker agreement, you've got your one property buyer broker agreement, and then unrepresented buyer. But again, at the end of the day, the big, big change is seller. You're gonna to start to see sellers, number one, no, no co-op compensation listed. It's gonna to have to be negotiated. So it all depends on the property. You know, a hot, hot property that is priced right that they know that they're gonna sell. They may or may not, you know, provide a 3% co-op and most buyer's agents are, you know, gonna want 3%. So there's gonna be some negotiating uh, going on. And as a buyer out there, you could get that co-op compensation paid to your buyer's broker and or pay it yourself or pay the difference. So that is the big change when it comes to the changes with the NAR settlement going into effect August 17th, 2024, across all the MLSs in the US. So that is the big change in regards to the impact that it's gonna have on buyers. Again, lack of transparency, no, no co-op listed in the MLS, not that a seller would pay a co-op and so, as a buyer out there, be prepared, number one, to sign a buyer broker agreement that goes over the commission and be prepared to have to come in with the difference or all of it, depending on the property and the offer and what the seller's willing to do. So if you have any questions or I just love your thoughts in terms of these changes, you know, I did a couple videos on it. I know there's a lot of people in the general public a small percentage of, of them think that this is a good thing because agents are overpaid. I would totally disagree with that. You have no idea what goes on behind the scenes and how much pro bono work agents do, whether it's previewing homes, you know, spending money on gas, doing research on properties, pulling comps, again, just preparing to go show homes. It takes a lot of work. And for, for years, all the years that I've been involved, the amount of pro bono work that I've done and work with buyers that never did anything or just disappeared because they changed their mind and you never, never got paid. So I would totally disagree. I think agents, <laughs> good agents out there are worth every penny and can save you thousands of dollars, whether you're a buyer or a seller. And the other thing too, just buyers out there, be prepared. There's going to be agents that are going to charge an upfront retainer fee for their services that are non-refundable, but would be credited back based on, you know, the commission and the percentage, whether the buyers, the seller's paying it or you're paying a portion of it, that that thousand dollar retainer would be credited back. So it doesn't go to waste. It only goes to waste if you disappear and the agent did a ton of work and now they're going to get paid for their time. So out of all the things that have happened, I think the retainer fee, in my opinion, is the one positive. But again, if there's a positive out there that you think, I'd love to hear it, but it lacks transparency. And at the end of the day, I still think there's gonna be some changes because there's gonna be, due to the lack of transparency, there's gonna be discrimination. And based on fair housing, I just can't see that down the road there's going to be further lawsuits based on discrimination because if you think about it, a seller, a lot of people have cameras and a seller based on for whatever reason could offer one set of commissions to one buyer and buyer's agent and another set of commissions to somebody else based on some type of discrimination. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Again, August 17 is the date. But again, in my opinion, I think it's not over and we'll see future changes in order to fix the lack of transparency and the discrimination issues that this change is going to create. And again, so time will tell. And but again, just wanted to keep you updated in terms of what's going on from the buy side and the changes and the impact starting August, 2024. Hey, thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. If you got some value out of this video, do me a huge favor. Give me an internet high five by liking it. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and comment below. And for more awesome real estate videos, you can subscribe to the channel. If you hit that bell button, each and every time a video comes out, you're going to be notified. And right here at the end of this video, YouTube is going to serve up another video that you might find interesting. In the meantime, make it a great day.